Yvonne and Yvonne Richards um, and we're running the Speakeasy. So this has been an event that we've hosted one previously uh, where we introduced you to the crew, myself, Chantelle and Jeff. Um, and the aim of the show is to give you a safe space where you can talk about topics that we don't talk about in the community. I think that one of the things we were really clear about when we set up Speakeasy was that to move into the 21st century, our community had to grow, but to grow, um, we had to move beyond or even challenge what we hold as traditional beliefs that are true to us, but may not be serving us anymore. We were interested in not just topics about health, but pushing the boundaries because we want to be a generation bigger, faster, stronger than we were before. And that means tackling some of the stuff that isn't easy to talk about. In saying that, yesterday was World AIDS Day in America. For those of you, you who know me already, I'm an HIV positive woman. And last week was um, National HIV Testing Week. So I've done a lot of shows on the TV, Channel 4 and the BBC about living your best life with HIV. I thought it would be useful to talk about the stigma of HIV, but also to talk about what it's like to live as a black person who is gay. So I welcomed um, Harvey Kennedy Pitt to the show and was really pleased when he decided to join us. Now, an absolutely fabulous biography it listed a host of things by which time not only figuring out who his identity was, but also setting up um, his company, Black Beetle um, Enterprises. But rather than tell you all of the things that Harvey's done, I wanted to introduce him and then let Harvey start the story himself. Welcome, Harvey, and thank you for taking the time out to be on Speakeasy. It's fabulous that you want to talk to us and because we were talking in the wings about your fab story. How do you figure out who you are? When did it begin? And how do you arc that into setting up a fantastic company, Black Beetle? Well, Yvonne, thank you so much for having me this evening. I think it's such an amazing thing to get to talk about things and to discuss things. And I, I recognise that I am not very traditional in my approach to the things that I enjoy discussing, uh, discussing and what I enjoy sharing, because I consider myself and probably only just a year ago, really put a word to it and said, I think I might be a conversationalist. <laughs> I think I enjoy conversations rather than just being chatty. I think I enjoy conversations and I'm hoping that we'll be able to have, you know, a conversation today and it's not just uh, sort of me just um, sort of lecturing in any sort of way. So, um, so yeah. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so from the beginning, so there, I've got a backstory of, the, you know, trying to come to terms with my HIV status. How did you figure out at what point do you think, right, OK, I am not the same as everybody else and then starting to put a finger on what the something else is that you may be? Yeah, from a non-sexuality perspective, I definitely knew that I was very different to people from a very, very young age. I didn't really get on with most children, um, just to be quite honest. Exclusions were a, a regular part of my upbringing, <laughs> you know, moving from school to school, regular part of my experience. Um, you know, people knew, particularly in our sort of faith community, if they heard my name, it was problems, <laughs> okay? Not because I was a bully, but because I was just a bit of a, um, a, a bit of a troublemaker, really. And I think it was um, a struggle to find myself and where I fit and, you know, uh, you know, constantly going through the process of falling out with people um, as I was trying to explore sort of where I fit, you know, where, where, when do I get to be the one that people enjoy being around and like and, you know, and enjoy um, being in the company of. And, and it took, you know, it, it took all of that um, reflection on those experiences to really realise that's probably what was going on. It wasn't that I wasn't capable. It wasn't that I wasn't intelligent. It wasn't that I didn't have the means, like I didn't, like I didn't have a supportive family. You know, my, I was really lucky to have both of my parents support me throughout my upbringing and they're still together today, which is um, something that we have to stop within our communities and go, huh, oh, 
that's all right, you know, that's interesting. It's not given that, you know, our parents are still together. So I do think that um, I knew I was very different from a very young age. Uh, and that was very present in the way that I interacted with people. And when you say your family was supportive, did you have a point where you said to them, OK, I think I'm gay? And they just said, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I think that's that's a um that would be that would be amazing if that's how it happened. I do know that was not how it happened. Um, I think that, and I, nor do I think that you come out once. I think that you come out for the rest of your life because there is an assumption that people look at you and they at least give you a bit of a chance to to you know to um, maybe be something that they're not assuming that you might be. Um, and so you do have to have that conversation multiple times throughout your lifetime. I still have to, every time I change change jobs or I go to a new, you know, a, a new group of people, I'm having to come out again um, and sort of go through those reactions of, oh, right, okay. Or, oh yeah, or even worse, oh, I know someone who's gay. If I hear that one more time, you, you see what I'm saying? So it, the process of coming out is ongoing. I don't think that we've arrived at a place where we stop coming out. I think that you continue to come out. And so even with my parents, uh, it wasn't just once. It was little hints and tips and tricks and testing the waters and seeing what are they going to say about it. Um, obviously, my parents were, are very conservative. Um, my dad was a pastor and my mom was a pastor's wife and a nurse. So, you know, you can do the calculation for yourself and see what the reaction of that is likely to have been. My God, no, because I stopped already and I just thought, oh, is that green leaf but over here in the UK? Because you said a pastor and a pastor's wife. And I just thought, oh. I know, green leaf, yeah. yeah but I'm just thinking that's heavy then. Because tell me, how did you wrap your head around religion and your sexuality? Because I'm just thinking that is like hell and damnation <laughs> and then the pressure of how do you walk through how do you walk through because i'm guessing so primary school mm -hmm. secondary school is it secondary school where you turn around and you're thinking okay i'm trying to find my space i know do you end up knowing your space and then turn around and say right drop in those hints mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the age of 10 for me. So age of 10 is a very significant year for me. I remember, you know, there's a person I describe, um, there's, a, there's a chapter of a book I've written recently that's um, sort of up for publication. And I talk about this experience about this, this, this boy named Eric, you know, uh, and, and just sort of thinking, describing it as a flood of a bucket of ice rushing down my back, re realizing, wait a minute, something's going on here, you know, um, and not knowing what that was other than hearing the term gay used in a derogatory type of sense toward me from other people. And I went, oh, so being gay is a bad thing. I get it. Thank you for all the help, all the comments. Thank everyone. You know, and thinking that's where it was going to end, but recognising, oh, I didn't realise that that was a, that this is an actual identity. I didn't know. Why would I know that? You know, we didn't have television until I was eight. We didn't have um, a computer in the house until I was 12. We didn't, I wasn't tapping into the things. What I had is I had church. I had my immediate family, I had my immediate community, and I went to my bed. That's what I did. That was my learning, <laughs> that was my learning process. So, so oh, yeah. the Bible. Yeah. We had the Bible yeah. as well. And I wasn't quite finding the page of where, <laughs> where yeah. I could find the answers to that question. So I talk about that, it's sort of in that piece of writing that I do, and I, I speak about exploring um, after bedtime, okay? When we go to bed, you know, I loved going to bedtime. It meant the house was quiet and I can get up and explore the house. I can get up and, you know, explore the bookshelves. I could read, I can look. And then we got this computer and I could then, I could start to Google. And then we had dial up. It had that sound and you thought, you thought goodness, it's going to wake the whole house up. But I've got to do this research. I've got to find out the answers to all these questions that I have. And it seems like this thing, this, this box in front of me seems to have all the answers. This is phenomenal. No, that sounds good. Yeah, the, the whole. Co did you tell any of your friends? How did you manage it? Because you said you dropped hints to your parents. You're dropping hints that potentially they're not. You know, I am not the person you think. So how do you get the support to put the the yay the nay on it? Did you dial up into the internet and find somewhere local in Manchester where you could go or 
in your local area? Where do you find the support to be able to figure out who you are? The thing is, I wasn't even looking for support. It wasn't about finding support to help. It was about finding understanding. And where I found safety was amongst the girls. Okay, and this is a classic sort of um, move that you see particularly represented in a lot of um, sort of television programs or about films. You see people wrapping them, their company up. They surround themselves with with the prettiest girls, the, the loudest girls, the girls who can fight the best, okay? Because no one's gonna touch me. I'm gonna surround myself with these amazing people. And then maybe in and amongst that, people will just think, oh, this is all just really fun and really funny. And uh, they will not think that. And so that's what I did. And it, it was, I didn't consult. I didn't read it on the internet. I didn't ask someone, what should I do? And they said, I'll go hang out with the girls. It was natural. It was innate that I felt, hmm, I feel safe gravitating towards the, the you know, the, the, the female presenting people in my circles because I felt that that was better than being with the lads and the blokes over here who were trying to bash my head in and calling me all different types of names. And I wasn't big enough to fight at that time. I'm now six foot two, I'm proud of it. And I wish they'd come for me now, but that's for another speak easy. I'm not gonna start that now. <laughs> that's inappropriate. But you know, it was, so that was the interim. It was the safety of being with sort of um, female presenting company, um, and um, and then and I say female presenting company or feminine energy. I say that because um, it's not about being um, just being um, you know the traditional sense of being a woman. You know, it was feminine energy felt safe because I was being criticised for having feminine energy, and I hate that. You know, femininity often gets sort of wrapped up in uh, in in being gay because there's loads of of butch and brawly men out here who will do yeah. you know will sort your business out you know and they're also gay you know and so we have a spectrum of, of presentations but in my case um uh, you know by association so that was the interim between getting from uh you know the safety to being able to even tell one of my friends um yeah. because at the time that the use of words like gay was derogatory and that was like okay i'm trying to not be that i'm trying to prove to you that i'm not that whatever that thing is i'm trying to I mean i'm not that um, I might be this, but I'm not that. Uh, so, um, but I remember telling one of my friends for the first time at the uh, age of 16. And I remember she responded to me, um, as many 16 year olds might do even today, by saying, Oh, my days, me too. Me too. <laughs> what? What, what did she say? Tell me what she meant by me too. So, so I wasn't thinking to go, like, Oh, I'm so pleased that you're also. No, that was my reaction. I was thinking, why are you taking the piss right now? Why are you actually making fun of me? This is serious. I'm telling you that I'm really think I I I I thought it highly unlikely. And it turns out that she was just on a, on a journey of exploring and understanding herself right. and stemming from something around insecurities and things. And she quickly fell out of that identity very rapidly, but was very supportive, you know, um at that time. But all friends were not like that. Okay. Some friends immediately dropped by the wayside. Definitely. Okay. Um, the male, you know, male presenting friends, the men, they were not part of the group that was informed about it. Um, it was very much those in the feminine energy, the safety. And so it was very, very gradual. Okay. And so just talk about what you mean by feminine energy, because I, again, I'm assuming anybody listening, that whole term feminine energy. So does it mean that you're a guy who is, you see, because when you talk about that, you're quite right. There are women. Can a woman have masculine energy? And, and mm -hmm. you're saying a man with feminine energy. Mm -hmm. Tell me what we feel or what you would sense if you're talking about the sort of feminine energy that made you feel comfortable. Because I'm just thinking you could have walked into, you know, women who have masculine energy mm -hmm. and not feel safe. Then what's the. Oh, what definitely. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I mean, and that's still something that I still feel, uh, which has even separated me from my own communities, because even within the black gay men's circle, I, you know, you might look at other black gay men who you could have dated or could have, you know, entered into some type of interaction with, and you go, mm, you remind me too much of, okay, and having to process that and go through and think, wait a minute, we're all, you know, we're all queer here, or we're all gay, we're all bisexual, whatever that thing is, this is supposed to be a safe space, but somehow that resistance of feeling is this presentation that I'm seeing you, is it going to betray me in the way that people who looked like you betrayed me so many years ago? And so we talk about feminine energy, it's, it's the opposite energy to that which was I associated with oppression, really. Oh. Um, and so those people that did not give me that positive energy, did not support me, did, you know, felt 
or made me feel unsafe. You know, feminine energy for, for me was the equivalent to safety at the time. And that's all you I keep told coming back to that, that, that there is a certain energy. It, so potentially you could have felt safe with the right masculine energy. Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, but it was about you needed to feel safe. And when you hit that energy, is it something that you can tangibly look for? Or is it just a sense of safety when you're around people? I think that we give off energy that we're not even aware that we're giving off. Okay, we we enter into spaces and we throw our shoulders around and we let our, you know our, our our hands dangle at our sides and we don't know the effect that that's having on people. Okay, people are, we're very perceptive, we're very spiritual people, we're very um, connected people with other humans, and we pick up on that energy. And so we even have to be really mindful of how we enter into spaces and how we present to other people because we can be giving people an entire story, an entire narrative that we didn't intend to give them, but we're coming across as being aggressive, or, or being um, intimidating to our own people. Not talking about you know um non non people of yeah, color yeah. Um, we could even intimidate or uh, push off or uh, create negative vibes for people who look just like us without even realizing it yeah. so it's just about being aware of, of the the possibility and the ability to give off energy that could be either positive or negative um uh, and because that can create a feeling of either safety or danger really in that situation how do you springboard from that then you've got <laughs> a circle of females who are giving you this energy where do you go from there because you're talking about 16 mm -hmm. right after that we've got college mm -hmm. college was that then into work into uni and how are you developing yourself yeah so what, one thing i want to go back to that you mentioned a bit earlier on is you, you mentioned religion mm. religion is easy for me to practice i'm very good based on my upbringing at practicing religion i know where to stand i know what to say i know when to bow my head i know when to raise my head i know when it's time to kneel or when it's time to just stand i know because i was practiced in that yeah. nobody could tell me i didn't know what was next on the program okay i know what's next on the program and i know what response to give in the situation yes so you revert back to what you're good at when you when you're not feeling safe when you're feeling out of your depths you you find yourself reverting back to the safety that is um, routine practice or religious practice or religion. And so that's the whole point. Why, why sometimes it's ironic that religion can actually feel safe. Sometimes it can feel um, comfortable. It can feel um, familiar and, and, and recognizable. You know, and you just want to sort of sometimes go back to that. So that's what I did. I was a musician. I played the violin. I played the piano. You know, I sing and I did those things and I did them well because I knew how to do them. And there was safety in the praise that you would get from the congregation, from your community. What a lovely song you're singing. Why I used to know somebody who could sing a song just like that. And you feel the pride and you feel, wow. So if I just keep doing this, nobody will know I'm gay. Nobody will criticize me. I would not feel unsafe. And I can just keep doing these things and the praise will keep going and I can buy a bit of time. Buy time though, because you're saying then that there must have been still a rumbling going on then while you're buying time. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I was just thinking you're, you're right because that's what I did in terms of my diagnosis and not managing it. What I did was revert to what I knew, which yes. was just looking after people. And I, I, I kind of, I thought that was because I was a woman, mm -hmm. but I think it is because looking after was what I was raised to do. Mm -hmm. For me, it was going to church to wait for that point that I was, I was supposed to get married because right. that was a trajectory for a woman. All I ever saw mm -hmm. happening was you know, you grew up in the church and we cleaned the pews. That was what I saw in the church that I went to. The women cleaned the pews, saw mm -hmm. out the plates, very much a secondary role. And in the meantime, God would send a man to you mm -hmm. and then you'd get married and that would be, you've done, you're done. And I never saw anything, yeah. Uh, and, and if I was lucky, I was going to end up in the choir, which I didn't because I couldn't <laughs> sing. But, yeah. <laughs> You're right, though, there is this whole persona that we take on Absolutely. when it comes to church. And it's not and it's a uh, it's based on a I remember someone saying it's based on the belief that the more 
righteous we get mm -hmm. the more we're going to buy into that place in the hereafter and uh, when you stand and look back now i see us working really 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 hard mm -hmm. and to me it's about digging underneath that why are we working hard at being so good because i wonder is our sense of shame so great that we have to it, it, almost like wash it away and that whole belief system where we are so defunct as human beings we need to work hard at hiding who we are but that's my aside but you're saying so you've been in church singing playing instruments and everything biding time so what then forces you to say i can't do this anymore well it's funny i just want to go back to one thing that you said and it's that it's the, it's the hard working it's all that stuff um which is ironic because you're also sort of alongside that you taught the narrative that you're not good enough and you you're we're all imperfect and so to be perfect we've got to be perfect in jesus christ so so if we can't be perfect why are we doing all this stuff again? Like, why are we doing, why are we working so hard? Like, what, why is this so difficult when I thought we'd agree that we were not going to be perfect? Okay, we're not perfect, so we're going to just go ahead and rest on that grace. That's conflicting. That's that's two different messages. And so that was when my, my questioning sort of started. I'm like, okay, so I'm looking at the stories of, um, you know, the, you know, um, you know, the, the man who had the issue, um, uh, the crippled man for 40 years, or the woman with the issue of blood, or you're looking at people like, um, you know, Zacchaeus, you know, all these people who are like, they, they had their own little stories, and you're like, oh, these are great, interesting stories, but it seems like they were imperfect people, and actually, Jesus lo loved these characters more than any other characters in the Bible. He, the disciples were great, okay, but he, he was most interested in the, the worst, and so I'm like, so here we are trying to be the best, hoping to get the attention and it's like that's not the attention that's not even the attention so just based on the story like the, as we know as the bible you know that that was conflicting and so i said okay we need to start asking questions so we had obviously you know what some people might call sunday school or sabbath school you know you go in and you ask questions and there was always resistance nobody knew the answer to the questions nobody wanted to explore that because that was even of the devil to explore a question that we didn't have an answer to that's the devil why are you letting the devil giving the, the devil a foothold mm -hmm. and so you sort of think to yourself wow you like this this can't be like we're not this can't be it so we start the praying process we start the praying process of saying okay they say if you just pray and you, you know you get down beside your bed and you do I did that for ages. I did that for ages. I kept, I remember keeping a diary at one point, and you know, I'm not really a big diary person, but I, you know, I did all of the, all the things I thought I was supposed to do. And it was, and the heavens were silent. Yes. Okay. Uh, to put it really frankly, the heavens were silent. So I waited and I was silent. You know, I, I remember sometimes being really extreme and saying, I'm giving you five minutes. You know, <laughs> you know, you try to put a limit. I'm, but if you don't get up. back to me, if you don't get back to me by the end of the day, I'm done. Yeah, you know, you know, you sort of do all this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so it's and and it was silent. The heavens were silent. The, the heavens are still silent. And so I said, if it's as simple as me sitting in the silence and you have a chance to speak, and you chose to say nothing about it, then I'm good. Because if it was that important and I was here willing with a complete open open mind and I heard nothing, how urgent could the situation have been? OK, you know, so that, that's sort of the, the reason that I went through. Uh, but I went to uni, you know, I still, you know, I, even in high school, I was, you know, dated, dated to, to present. You know, I had girlfriends in high school and I, you know, and I went on to uni and I, I had a, a long term relationship then as well. That sort of um, naturally dissolved, uh, you know, toward the end of my uni experience. Um, and I, I was the type of uni I went to was quite like a, a like a small private faith college. Um, um, actually university over in the United States and um, the practice is that when you finish uni you get engaged you get married okay and so you were sort of working toward getting to the last year of uni and then you propose well, not, what, what are we 21 22 what, who are you proposing to what are you doing? I look back at myself like have you lost your mind what a waste like come on like you know take your time what are you doing um, and because but that, that was how we were supposed to present that's what that was the goal we were encouraged to do that and um, I remember going to visit my partner at the time's parents. And I, of course, in the true um, Christian way, you stay at one house, they stay at the other house, and then you can go and you can go and speak to the parents and ask for, ask for hand, asking for hand at 21, you know, asking for hand. 
Okay. All right. No job. No job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no job, but you're asking them. So, uh, <laughs> so I, you know, and I, I remember sort of going the night and, you know, they sort of almost endearingly sort of like, yeah, right. Okay. You know, very wise adult people. And I'm, 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 I'm being taken back, you know, sort of come back to the place where I was staying, which was a friend of the family's. Um, and I remember her dad was driving really slow. Driving really slow. I was like, oh God, he's driving slow. Why is he driving And he just said, you know, I know, right? I said, sorry? What he said? He said, well, well you know that, you know that I, I know about the thing. I was like, what's the thing? Like, help me out, okay? <laughs> you know, give me some context. Um, and the fact is, it happens. But, you know, well, the worst thing is, is um, when people try to hang on, and a lot of people get hurt in the process. People get married, they change their mind, they have children, the children get hurt. And I was going, well, this has gone a really long way. And, you know, Mr. What's his name? And I said, uh, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, this is unfair. I, I absolutely love your daughter. What are you saying? I would never, I would never do anything to hurt your child because I was still determined to um to push through and do what i was being asked to do rather than what i knew i should have been doing got back to the place where i was staying and i was going up the stairs i remember seeing a little black thing on the stairs and i couldn't like i thought i'd left my socks i'm thinking oh these people think i'm gonna be like i'm a terrible guest and i reached out to pick this thing up wasn't it a gun okay a gun on the stairs i don't know if it was loaded or not loaded but the gun was on the stairs and i just put the handle of the gun back down and i went back up to my room and i thought to myself i said i said god if this is what it's leading to, if that is what this means, I don't want anything to do with this type of struggle because it's not that serious. Yeah. But I just, because in some ways what I find difficult is because we don't talk about it. It's like you said, you're going through a process where we are expected by 21 to be married. Yeah. 21. Because when I look back now, one of my friends was married. A lot of us were married. And for us, it was like um, a beauty contest. <laughs> you know, all the girls were breaking their necks to line up to be married off to these guys. And I know there's been a lot of divorces since then because we were so busy putting up the front, front in it. <laughs> we were busy getting married not whether we were compatible it was all yeah if you got the pastor's son you've picked off the top of the tree mm. but your identity as a woman was linked to the man that you married yeah. and yeah. so suit suited mm -hmm. come into it it was whether the two of you were righteous enough and you got together to create this this mythical lifestyle this religious lifestyle and our identities were based on what we thought people would expect absolutely of and not being able to yeah you're right you're not able to say what you want and there was me wanting to be more than somebody's wife mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and not being able to step into that space because for me what i worried about is if i step out of line you lose your community if yeah. i step out of line and i'm not who you want to be not only will i lose the community but what have i got then because what you're told is out there the world is hostile mm -hmm. and out there it, anything less than what we're offering in here is not safe mm -hmm. and is a punishment for leaving the flock in some ways you know what i mean so you hit 21 this guy's dropping hints about i know i know did he ever kind of come out and just say what he thought he knew or did he leave the it's horrible because i'm just thinking did he leave the gun did they leave the gun yeah i don't i don't i mean it's definitely i think that the person i was staying with was a, an ex copper so that was you know that was my i could assume it would it belong to him but i remember very clearly seeing it and i couldn't i could not believe that's what I was looking because I've never seen a gun. I had no reason to have seen a gun, um, but I saw one that day, you know, and and I, I and it was heavy. I remember not think. I remember thinking to myself, I didn't know a gun was that heavy, um, because why would I've ever known how heavy a gun would be? Yeah. So and I got back up to my you know the room I was staying in, and I, I remember I got on my knees and I said, "That's it. We're not doing like we're not we're not doing that. We're not going to do that because it's not that serious. I'm not going to do that." Let me know when you need me. You know where to find me because you're everywhere, right? You let me know. 
And that was it. That was the last time. And I, I remember that, you know, we sort of finished. That that hit me really hard because I thought I'd played the game really well. I thought I was going to get to the finish line. I was going to make everybody happy. Um, and I was, I was pumping so much into this, trying to be this person. Um, uh, so that when it ended, sort of two months, one month, two months after that, she said, oh, there's, you know, this is not going to work out. And so, you know, looking back, it all adds up. Obviously, she was chatting to her parents. Her parents were chatting to her. They were feeding each other. And that's, and that's good. And it's fair to her. And I've, I've learned to accept that over the years and say, actually, good. Good on you to be brave enough to call it like you saw it. Because you've actually, in doing so, you've liberated me as well. So you've liberated yeah. yourself, but you've liberated me as well. You let me go. Yeah, um, I don't have to, to do myself. it anymore. No. Yeah. Um, and I'm, but the impact that had on me, I remember that same month, probably around that same month, my car broke down. I lost my 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 um, my leadership role that I was in at the time. I was um, sort of taking care of the student flats, you know, as so I would check in and make sure people were cleaning their areas and, you know, keeping, maintaining the building, um, and, which was helping to pay my, my tuition at the time. Uh, it was exam week. I remember I was so heavy with the situation. I, I failed my, and I'm going to say it, I failed my biostatistic exam. <laughs> and, I, and I'm a public health practitioner. <laughs> and the first biostats exam, my final, I actually failed and I had to, I had to reset the exam. Um, so just putting it out there, you can still become <laughs> a public health practitioner if you fail biostats. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I had to take it again. But I remember that day after day, I would because the sort of the flats were sort of across the street and you had to walk across, you know, quite a, almost like a motorway, like a do carriageway across to get down into the campus. And I remember crossing the road and I refused to look left and I refused to look right and I refused to cross on green because I wanted to get hit. I wanted something to hit me so that when it hit me and I died, people would know that I wasn't, I wasn't joking and that I had tried my best. Oh God. That, that's where we, that's where we were at. I did that for weeks. I did it for weeks. Many a close call, I tell you, but I did it for weeks because I wanted, I just wanted to be heard in that situation. Mm. And that's the feeling when people talk about, you know, um, feeling suicidal, feeling, you know, um, that's the impact. And if you can still turn around and tell me it's because you haven't, there's nothing you can say after that sentence, okay? It's because you haven't. Oh, no, no, hold on. I've done everything I need to do. I've done everything I need to do. Have you done what you need to do to help me get through what I need to do? You know, that, that's my question um, to, to that community, you know? And so, um, so I ran, I ran away to South Korea. You know, I went to, for a gap year and I said, you know, I'm gonna go to South Korea. I'm not gonna deal with this community at all. I'm, I need to go away and to a where nobody knows me um, and I need to just get away. Mm. Uh, and I went for 10 months. And six years later, when I finished with my career experience, <laughs> because that's what happens. You get there and you're like, wait a minute, this whole freedom thing is great. Why would I want to leave the freedom situation? I've got a job. They've flown me out here. That yeah, I'm, I'm teaching um, sort of English, um, which is like I could do with my eyes closed, my hands tied behind my back. What, what well, am I going to do? Yeah. And, and uh, in some ways, the, the psychological freedom is about putting down the stuff, all that stuff that you carried. Like I grew up in the church and I didn't see a place for women there. Mm -hmm. in the sense that the leadership roles or the ability to aspire so I guess one of my questions for you now is has the church changed for you now have you evolved have you made peace with church or is it still a case of it's back there church will the church experience and my story will always be my story so that's, that's not going to change and I think I'm um, trying to there were certain aspects of my adulthood where I thought I could wash it away you can go to the dirtiest club in underground London okay and people will be like so what church do you go to people know people know when they see a church person they're not fooled by you trying to put on your black leather and and, and, and put on your little fake fake uh, piercings and your little necklace and trying to do a couple of buttons down to try and blend it everybody else they know because when you go through a church experience like that you can't just wash that away. That's part of your, that's part of your, your existence. Yeah. It's part of the energy that you put off. Go back to that energy again. But one decision I did make for myself, <laughs> true story, all that. Uh, so <laughs> one decision I did make for myself, as I said, um, I need to separate religion and spirituality because something is telling me these two are not even supposed to be in the same place. But somehow one is sufficing for the other and one is covering for the other one. But they need to be in two separate places. 
because the confusion is where we're losing people. Um, and so the one I set to the side was the religious aspect, this whole thing of having to be a place once a week or twice a week, sometimes more for some denominations. Um, this whole thing of, uh, you know, if I'm not on the on the on the um, on the pulpit helping with music or something else, something must be wrong with me because we know that you play instruments. So why are you sat in the congregation? Why are you not helping out? What's got you struggling? How's what's got you into pray? I'm like, I was taking. It wasn't my week. I was off the road to this. What are you talking about? You know, the people create stories, you know, in their head. I, said, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But spirituality, things like being, um, showing gratitude, um, being mindful, reflecting, um, caring for other people, um, taking care of yourself, taking pride in your body, being mindful what you eat, being mindful what you drink, how much you drink, you know, um, things that you know are hurting you this is a spiritual that's a spirituality thing i didn't need i didn't need religion to tell me to do those things but the things i learned in a religious context feed those things that i still live by today and those same values of knowing when to apologize being able to forgive and forget you know things that have happened you know these are basic not murdering anyone can we just you know do we need to make the list longer you know there are basic things that we say we think that they they happen in isolation people practice these things every single day I know, but I think that's really interesting because I think once I'd had my diagnosis, I thought it was a case of never darken the church's door yeah. again. Again, never again, yeah. yeah. But what I did find was the same as you, that I had to make peace with yeah. my spiritual self and not yeah. religion because yeah. I realised that the religion that I had thought should serve me wouldn't serve me because it wasn't what I needed. Mm. and that I found once I'd made peace with myself and developed a spirituality that worked for me and it's not it's like you said it's not about cobbling anything together maybe it was about because of my experiences checking in on my inner integrity what really works for me and you're right some of that is based off what I'd learned from church but mm -hmm. just like a parent I looked at the church and said I've seen the best and the worst of you mm -hmm. I'll take the best and leave the rest mm -hmm. and what I cultivated in terms of my own spiritual senses okay then how does that make me feel mm -hmm. and is it in alignment with the person the, the spirit that I have inside and your new um, values and your new values yeah. to develop new values yeah so we've been talking about that you've developed your spiritual self church has informed that religion has informed that tell me about black beetle tell me about oh. why you needed to create that space so black beetle health i think what a lot of people don't realize about black beetle health is that is the name people always say but why the name and i say oh well it's, it's so obvious to me but i forget that i have to remember to explain that to other people and it's based on something called biomimetics so bi biomimicry so i'm a scientist i studied science as my first degree uh and bi biomimicry or biomimetics really gives us a chance to think about examples that already exist in nature and the way that nature is dealing with its problems of diversity and resilience and uh, and cohabitation and and co cooperation and uh, sy and symbiosis and you know ways that nature is already finding answers to what it's doing and we're going quick we, we got to think of an idea do we the examples are already there in nature for us to just look and see like so 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 symbiosis the concept of of, of animals um, creatures working together one one might cast off something and the other creature says oh I can do something with that that's that's a symbiotic relationship um, you know we talk about resilience we know that every single winter the trees take all the nutrition back into their into their their, their, their wood or into, into the bark and then when spring comes they release all that same nutrition nothing has died it's simply got, gone into a new phase and so the importance of going through phases and, and reserve um, sort of um, protecting resources um, so that you can do something at a later time you know or uh or think about diversity we know that without biodiversity nothing's going to survive in in the ecosystem so everything's got to work together so that's collaborative working that's working with stakeholders you know they're all examples that we already know but we've got to give credit where credit is due and that's the nature really so tell me the beetle 
Why not an antelope, not so, the lion? Yeah, so, so I thought about like, oh, I should call it Black Panther. Now they're going to take me down immediately. Not, they're not going to fund that. Um, and and nor, nor was I actually seeking funding. Really, I was just starting with an Instagram. I wanted to start on Instagram. I was going to post a couple of cute little quotes. You know, I'd start my doctorate by then. Uh, finished my first year my doctorate and I just wanted to you know give it a little you know a, a little place to just dump some of the learnings okay um and I looked at you know black bear and I was you know that's you know black black panther no black let me see okay google black creatures and animals let's see which one is the best one literally the process I remember being downstairs in the kitchen on a on a on a, a Sunday I think it was um uh and just thinking what can we what can I you know um and then the beetle came along I started reading characteristics of the beetle um they communicate with with rhythm and vibration i said hmm, that sounds like us uh you know it comes in all shapes and sizes hmm, that sounds like us uh you know as a community now uh you know um oh it's got a hard shell on the outside but it's soft on the inside hmm, that's how we're often interpreted okay as being hard on the outside but soft on the inside okay and and the list sort of went on as far as um its resilience you know all the different colors it comes in all the shades and thinking that black is actually inclusive of all the colors and so I'm thinking we also speak to colorism in that as well. Um, and there's been some feedback. People said, don't you know, they used to call us roaches. You know, why would you choose a beetle? OK, if you want to read it in that way, that's fine. But here's my interpretation of that thing. OK. Or maybe we uh, turn it around as well. Yeah. Like using the N word. You take yeah. something that's negative and turn it into something positive. But it's really well, that's a bad example. Yeah. But <laughs> well. maybe, maybe the Q word, maybe even more than the N word. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Try and get the context and the gist of what I'm saying because I don't use yeah, yeah. it at all because I don't like it, but yeah. people have reinvented it. Yeah. But yes, so I am now, now it makes sense to yes. us because yeah. I had no idea why it was a black beetle. Yeah. So the concept, yes. tell me about what um, black beetle wants to achieve and who mm -hmm. it's aimed at. Yeah, so um, my sort of, uh, initial research I was looking at in my doctorate was linked to something I had to do in my master's degree, which was looking at sort of barriers to why people don't go into testing for HIV. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I was looking at sort of men with sex with men, so MSM, um, which we've sort of now extended to sort of GBMSM, so gay, bisexual, and other men with sex with men. Or um, we've been extended that even further to say sort of black sexual minority men, you know, so you, it just depends what group you're talking to. Um, so I'm looking at sort of ratio, ratio sexual minorities as a whole now, whereas my journey sort of started with just MSM um, in South Korea, specifically because I was living in South Korea at the time. Um, and then I tried to get to the research and I felt distant. I felt distant from that research and I felt like I was getting pushed out because they're like, I mean, it's Asian men. You know, we feel a certain way about, you know, people who are not actually Asian working on the project. I felt all of that energy okay uh, in the room and i decided mm, okay let me back away from this published that article went to a journal fine great never heard much more about that had a chance to do my doctor and i said how can i now duplicate this same conversation in my own communities that i relate to because no one can then tell me i can't have the conversation yeah. my identity my experience the same barriers all the sociocultural factors i talk about like stigma like stereotyping like faith like shame, like fear, like mistrust, the list goes on. I recognize all of those. I've experienced all of those. So no one can take my lived experience from me. No one can say I'm not suitable for a study. I'm like, sorry, I was just trying to understand my own experience. And if that's upset you, you know, you, you have to explore that within yourself. So um, I sort of shifted it. And I created this um, concept of evaluating the effectiveness of, of sort of existing sexual health services. Well, I think it was just sexual health services at the time for uh, Afro-Caribbean Black Black African men of sex with men. That's since expanded a bit to sort of looking at sort of a, a greater spectrum. And I looked, and I looked, and I looked. And the examples that existed um, for services and examples in the UK, in modern Britain, as I call it, um, that really catered to these groups did not exist. Um, I saw a few examples and uh, the model was good and I liked that. Um, or I saw, um, I'd heard of, you know, plans that people had, and um, they're okay. Uh, but I really wanted to find out, okay, so we've created services. So how, how's that going? How effective is that? And I just wanted to ask the question. I wasn't saying that like, services didn't exist or that people hadn't tried. I just wanted to find out how it's going. Okay. And if it's not going well, how can we improve that? And so that's now sort of expanded to being, um, you know, um, understanding, you know, how uh, effective services are at this point for um, racial sexual minorities, um, such as LGBT, you know, black and people of color. Um, in modern Britain, and that's what I'm looking at now. So, uh, but I didn't find the place that I could use 
you know, I could use that, you know, that I could explore that. It didn't exist. So I said, okay, what's in my hand? We've done this already. I have other examples of what's in my hand, what's in my hand, what's in my hand. Another Moses reference for any people listening to that. That's a, that's a Moses reference when God said, what's in your hand? Uh, <laughs> your rod. So I, I said, what's in my hand? That point in church. That yes, oh, that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's, um, and I said, okay, if you don't see it, create it. Okay, so I start my little Instagram. I said, okay, well, I see some people got a Facebook, great Facebook. Okay, then people start reaching out in the DM saying, oh, could you come and be on this panel? Could you? I was thinking, uh, you know, does, does anyone in your organization, anyone in my organization, it's just me. Okay, you know, and so I start reaching out to, I said, oh, this is actually a thing. Like people are actually like tapping into this. I think we probably had 10 followers at the time. It was mainly people I already knew, you know, and it was, you know, it was just a really um, such a stab um, in the dark, really seeing if it was going to actually take flight and I didn't try to do it just to be clear okay it, it might be to help happened okay it just happened it's still happening sometimes things pop into my inbox and I go interesting didn't know we were doing that okay because it's just happening organically when you put something um behind um on a table and put the community behind it things start happening no things just start happening and so I think it's just amazing to see how that happens so I started attending I reached out to friends who were you know maybe doing similar things public health what are you you, you study mental, mental health still studying it come on you know like just just pull people and said we'll learn as we go we'll figure it out come on everyone just come in that's so, lovely though that's yeah. lovely because you keep thinking right I've got to get bags of money I, <laughs> I've got to know people for a long time and like you said a doctorate and then a doctorate on top of the doctorate mm -hmm. and I've got to go to the bank with me my business plan and you're just saying just I, think, I, said, I said I can't pay you anything so I was I was paying them out of my, my you know my charity salary at the time I said like, okay I want to send you to this thing yeah, I'll, I'll pay for your tram yeah, how much is it? Seven quid. Oh, seven quid. Oh, anyway, I'll pay for it. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, and I would just pay, and and uh, I would count my losses. If I had to walk and they had to ride, I would walk and they would ride. Okay. If if I had to, if they had to eat and I had to not eat, then they would eat and I wouldn't eat. You know, because I had to count my losses. Um, and people stuck. You know, that, that core team really stuck with me. And obviously, the, the the team has changed. Um, um, over the the year and a half that we've you know been in, in operation, but it's it's coming. It's where it needs to be it's landing right where uh, you know it needs to be to ensure that we're doing justice to the, to the community um and it's peer-led it's community driven it's organic uh it incorporates an advisory board of, of more experts in the field who work in other capacities we have a board of trustees of highly skilled people across communications and business and, and arts and culture and uh and hopefully public health soon so if you listen to this and you're a public health um practitioner and you think you'd like to um, um sort of take on a trustee role talk to me, drop me an email because we want to really make sure that it's comprehensive and representative. So it's, yeah, and it's people sort of think PLC organization, oh, right, okay, everyone say so you mean black. And I was really determined not to make it just another black organization. I said, if we're going to say PLC, let's look at the spectrum, all different shapes, all different sizes, all different colors, all different backgrounds, all different languages, let's try it okay so you know really trying to diversify it just so easily slips into into black you know and that's important and there's a space for that but how do we work like nature is working okay how do we work like nature is working and bringing it back to that concept of bringing them as they come piecing them together and finding out how that biodiversity concept can be mimicked in this space how can we do that so because we started this by saying black activism. So you're saying in that description that activism isn't about us all being the same. You're saying it, it evolves a natural evolution into something that works for us. Is it beyond, have we got caught up in our own stereotype of what a black activist looks like? What do you yeah, think? Well, I, I, well, I call it, even myself, I call it blacktivism because I think blacktivism is its own thing sometimes, you know, and I think that I've probably even put that on my socials somewhere that, you know, blacktivist, uh, you know, um, because there's a time and a place. And I think that where black activism takes centre stage is A, because it's who shouts the loudest, okay? But it's also um, about sometimes who has been the most oppressed. And due to things like colorism, it often leaves black people down the end of the spectrum. And so we end up being the ones that actually experience the worst. Someone called me light skin the other day. I was shocked because I've, I've never considered myself to be that. It must have been good lighting. 
Okay, so because because for me, I'm experiencing what I'm experiencing. And so we even do it to each other and we say, oh, it's okay because you're a certain shade. Okay, you can be a certain shade and be hard to look at. Okay, <laughs> so you can, you know, so it's not about that. It's about, it's about that energy yet again. But black activism tends to just take the mic in the center stage because it's representative of the most oppressed group of people. We were, I was having a conversation with one of the um, members of my team the other day. And we were talking about colorism and and you know what it's like uh, being a certain shade and, and you know how worshipped you know fair skin still is and so we have that light skin privilege we have people in smaller bodies privilege we have people in taller bodies privilege you know it's there's there's all the different types of things before we even go into white before we even go into non-black yeah. there's lots of privilege right here in this circle and so blacktivism does have its own place i'm not saying that that's not important what i'm saying is um, there are allies, okay? There is also um, political blackness, okay, we need to address as well. There's being blackness, but there's also political blackness and all of the people on the spectrum who come under that same umbrella. Of, Tell me what political blackness is. Ooh, that's a, that, you need a new session for that. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, in one minute, tell me what okay, political one minute. blackness so, is. So uh, political blackness is less about the color of the person's skin, um, what shade it is, um, and it's unified based on a joint experience, okay, that those people have had. Um, and when people group based, group together based on the oppression they've received, suddenly everyone is friends in that space. Ah, interesting. Okay, so colorism is no longer yeah, an issue. If th people of three different shades go into a space where someone does not like non-white people, okay, all three are gonna get it. You can be Asian, you can be black, you can be African, you can be African Caribbean, okay? You can be uh, Sri Lankan. We know, uh, you know, there's plenty of Sri Lankan who is a darker hue, okay? You're all politically black and you'll be equally disliked, okay? Even within the concept of, of colorism where we know there's light skin privilege, but, um, and good hair privilege and long hair privilege. Yeah. Right, okay, all of this. Um, but I'm also wondering if people take time to consider the political blackness and what that entails and who should come under that umbrella and that rule in this together really as a community. Okay. So who do you question. want? Yeah, no, because I'm thinking you're touching on some of the, well, I, I always hear the word self-stigma, self-stigma, but we're not addressing some of the unhealthy attitudes we've picked up we've got five minutes left what yeah. would you want somebody to take away from activism or about black beetle and about yourself as a man gay man what are the key takeaways for me some i, I was going to say something positive but i don't even think <laughs> we want that i was saying what are the key takeaways if someone were listening today yeah, so there's nothing uh, uh, such, there's no such thing as too black. There's no such thing as not black enough. There's no such, not such thing, uh, there's no such thing as I'm better than you because it's about what you know about people. Hey, let's be honest about that um, because we're all just human, okay? And there's this whole thing about, um, okay, I'm living with HIV, I'm not living with HIV. I work in sexual health versus I um, seek help for my sexual health um, outcomes, okay? Great. Okay. So does that mean that you're immune? Does it mean that you're not going to be, you know, um, that you'll never be at the table getting a shot in your bum or that you're never going to have to do a swab? No, because you're human. So thanks for sharing the information. I hope you're also getting tested. Thank you. Uh, you know, just pushing it back and saying, actually, let's just even the playing field. Let's be fair to ourselves and to other people and recognize that we all play a role in the biodiversity of life and well-being and progression and uh you know and togetherness we all play our role in that but there's no superior role to another role because you've done something you had something we're all in this we're all in this uh and we're all like equally um sort of susceptible to when life can go downhill okay and life can go you know uh, uh, anybody at any time absolutely so I, I think it's just like it's a bit like let's humble ourselves okay let's bring it right down okay and remember sort of um what what our common experiences look like yeah and who the oppressor is um sometimes it can be us we can be our own oppressor as well okay according to um, audrey lord um you can read more about sort of that um in some of her writings and it's uh you know we can be our own oppressors as well yeah i think so and, too. and unify on that front yeah. yeah no that was brilliant 
what would be really useful to, for me is that I know after listening to this, people may want to contact you. So would it be OK for us then to have your details and your link so that if um, people are interested, we can refer them directly to Black Beetle? And yeah. is there um, other, you, you mentioned books. So if you have your book and you want us to put it, um, as part of the speakeasy so that if there are young lads or girls out there who are feeling how do I manage being different and being black and mm -hmm. do it positively would that be okay to use the title and yeah can you tell us what the title is so that we can check yeah so uh, so it's not my book I'm writing a chapter for that book um, and that's still that's yet to be put forward for publication so I'll leave it to uh, the, the the editor to to sort of promote that but when it does come out we will be promoting it on our platform as well um uh, and of course that's for lads girls and all people okay so non-binary people as well just want to uh, I apologize <laughs> yeah. just want to support our siblings um yeah and so but you can reach us sort of at blackbeetlehealth.co.uk is our website so www.blackbeetlehealth.co.uk um if you want to drop us an email just a general query or you want to just uh, you know let us know something you can reach us on admin um admin admin at blackbeetlehealth.co.uk if you want to speak to me directly my email is harvey at blackbeetlehealth.co.uk so that's h-a-r-v-e-y at Black Beetle Health with double E's, so not beetle like the beetles, okay? <laughs> so beetle is the, the creature beetle. Um, so blackbeetlehealth.co.uk. Um, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, where, you know, we, we have a mailing list. If you want to join a mailing list uh, and um, be a direct recipient of some of our resources that we put out or know about other events we're doing, hop on it, we're there. No, that'd be absolutely brilliant. And don't forget, for those of you who are listening, if there's anything that has touched your heart, contact Harvey Direct or don't forget we are the BHA Speakeasy crew um, and we are available at Speakeasy, S-P-E-A-K-E-A-S-Y at the B-H-A dot org dot U-K and either myself, Jeff or Chantel will um, answer any queries we've got or redirect you to Harvey. But anything that we've said today, if you want to follow it up, please feel free. Don't be a stranger. So I think, Harvey, we've reached the 59th minute and it <laughs> felt like no time at all. Um, That's a good sign. Yeah, no, it's been absolutely good fun. Um, we'll be doing another, another one of these next month. We've got one scheduled for once a month, every month. Would you be interested in coming back again? Because I've had such a fantastic time. It'd be great to explore more of the stuff that you're doing and your evolution would be absolutely fantastic and more to the point, really inspirational um so that'd be great if you'll have me if you'll have me <laughs> oh no definitely thanks for everything right ladies and gentlemen and all in between yes thank you for your time this has been Yvonne at Speakeasy and I look forward to seeing you again thank you